Hello everyone. Uh, in this video, I'm going to continue our previous discussion about competition. Uh, so this interspecific interaction in which both parties lose at least a little bit. Um, we were talking about the competitive exclusion principle, um, which essentially says that two species who occupy the same niche cannot coexist. And so there's this famous um, example here um, of two protospecies grown uh, separately just fine, but then when you put them together, there is a clear winner and a clear loser. Um, then I asked you guys to recall um, some examples that we were discussing. Um, so red and gray squirrels, seemingly they occupy the same niche. So what's up with that? Um, and then if you look to Africa, for example, there are tons of different species that are um, occupying what would seem at first glance to be the same niche. Um, so somehow these organisms have ex have avoided competitive exclusion. And uh, as we were discussing, um, essentially this is completed by niche partitioning. Um, different species can uh, partition niches apart spatially. Um, so generally this is uh, considered to be um, in horizontal space. Here we can see each species has its own um, subset um, of the parameters um, of its fundamental niche or uh, yeah, of its fundamental niche, so a much reduced realized niche. Um, this can also be uh, in vertical space as well. So with our classic uh, <laughs> lizard examples here. Um, also, we have uh, true vertical niche partitioning. Um, so different animals are able to um, utilize uh, vegetation at different heights. Um, also plants can utilize uh, different space, um, both above ground as well as below the ground. So both the roots and the shoots. Um, we left off talking about uh, temporal niche partitioning. Um, so uh, different herds are able to migrate back into an area. Um, and so they are taking advantage of the resources within a physical space at different times. So they're not actually directly competing with one another. Um, I also told you guys about um, ants, right? Uh, this example is ants. Uh, so here we have clearly nocturnal ants. This species is clearly diurnal. And then when there is less pressure from both the, uh, the nocturnal ants, which are going to bed, and the diurnal ants, which are waking up, you get these crepuscular ants right here taking advantage of the uh, lessened competition. Um, there's one more example that I want to um, elaborate on, and that's going to bring us all the way back to uh, the very beginning of our class together. Um, we talked about these termite mounds, right, and how these termite mounds, um, you know, essentially are uh, uniformly distributed because um, those termites um, fiercely compete with each other for resources, right? So that means that those uh, mounds have to be really spread far apart. Um, I want to go back to these environments and um, you know, point out that the termite mound itself is filled with um, lots of rich vegetation, um, some really high quality food. Um, and of course it is surrounded by grassland, so really different type of environment. Um, now there is um, an ongoing research study um, of you know, these termite mounds and the herbivores that take advantage of them, um, in addition to the termites themselves. Um, and so what I want to bring up, the example study that I want to talk about, um, is looking at three different species seemingly occupying the same exact niche, but maybe not. Um, and so the three examples here are bushbuck, which is the smallest, nyala, which is the medium-sized herbivore, and then kudu, which is monstrous. Okay, so these three different animals seemingly um, able to eat all of the same foods, right? They both or all three of them have the same, um, you know, diurnal activities, okay? uh, and they might actually be in the same uh, vicinity at the same time. So they're not migrating in and out at different times. Um, so uh, scientists uh, essentially um, want to figure out how these three organisms are partitioning um, the larger niche. Uh, and so what they did was they, um, they tagged them with both a satellite color as well as a radio telemetry color. Um, and so what they could do is they could see exactly where these guys were hanging out, get a pretty good idea of where they were, um, and then go in with 
um, their radio telemetry gear and really find them on the ground. Um, the reason for this is that they're actually looking for scat, right? So for the poo of these animals, um, it has to be really fresh. And the reason it has to be really fresh is because um, once the animal runs off, uh, the scientists collect um, the scat uh, and they take it right to the lab. And what they do is they uh, analyze the DNA of the partially digested plant material that is still within that scat. Um, so they've been able to uh, compare the DNA from the fecal matter to um, a data bank of uh, of genetic sequences. And so they can actually use what is called DNA metabarcoding to figure out exactly what um, these individuals ate, you know, within a few hour period. Um, and so this is really new technology. It is uh, relatively non-invasive. Uh, previously to uh, explore what an animal was eating, you actually had to look at its stomach contents. And so that is obviously not ideal. Uh, so this is uh, minimally invasive and they can learn a lot about the ongoing habits of these animals um, instead of just learning about one particular moment in time. Um, so really cool um, upcoming uh, technology. Uh, this information is um, a small subset of the information published in a fairly recent paper. Uh, so what they found was that, um, as you might imagine, these different species are essentially eating different types of foods, right? Even though they can all eat the same things, what they found is that the bushbuck, which is the smallest um, of the three animals, was mostly, or was spending most of its time on the termite mounds, um, and therefore it was, um, eating mostly those really highly nutritious foods um, that were produced by um, the extra nutrients in the soil of the termite mound itself. Um, so uh, compare this to the largest, the kudu, um, generally they found that these ones were browsing the lowest quality grasses, right? More of them, but lower quality. Uh, and so this makes sense um, in that the bushbuck is by far the smallest, um, therefore it has a relatively higher metabolism than the other two animals do. Um, and furthermore, and maybe uh, more acutely important to the animal is that it's a lot smaller and so it might be more vulnerable to predation. So the more time it spends um, munching around on the low quality grasses, trying to build up to some threshold of enough nutrients, um, that's just more time spent being vulnerable. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense for the bushbuck to have a quick high quality meal and then to go back into hiding. Okay. And the kudu on the other hand, uh, it can spend a lot more time browsing lower quality materials uh, because it is so much larger. Okay. Um, and so this is the final type of niche partitioning that I want to mention, uh, and this is called dietary niche partitioning. Um, essentially, even though all of these animals are living in the same place at the same time, they can all eat the same stuff. They are ultimately divvying up the different resources among the different species. And um, so what this graph is showing us um, on the two axes, um, it's just a scale that is incorporating a lot of different types of factors, um, you know, spatial factors as well as um, prey or in this case vegetation species. Um, and so take home message here is that generally the species are or the individuals within a species are clumping together and that those clumps have very little overlap between the two species. Okay, so they are um, partitioning their diet. Um, to reduce competition, therefore reduce the negative effect on all of the species. Okay. Um, over time, uh, this uh, niche partitioning can drive uh, evolution, essentially. Right? So it can drive character displacement. Um, essentially, if um, you know, an animal is eating only one type of food for any length of time, it's uh, morphology, right, the population's morphology is going to shift to maximize um, the efficiency of uh, eating that particular substance. Um, so, um, you know, over time, 
over generations, maybe the teeth will get bigger, maybe they will be, um, you know, it, able to break down like a rougher material if that is what they're eating um, for a long time. Um, so some scientists call uh, these morphological traits, um, ghosts of competition past. Um, so essentially, um, a lot of the different characteristics, a lot of the different phenotypes that we see in um, the different species are really just a product of many, many generations of competing and therefore reducing their um, niche to some realized niche, okay? Um, so that they aren't so heavily competing with other species. And we've seen this so many different times before. Um, you know, Darwin's finches are a classic example. We see this adaptive radiation driven by competition-based character displacement. Um, we see that um, giraffes have these ridiculously long necks, and that really is because of um, competition acting as a selective pressure and therefore exaggerating these characters of these phenotypes. Um, we also see nocturnal animals, right? So they, um, you know, ultimately uh, partition their niche. They choose the night, right? Or somehow come to um, be active in the night. And over time, they are able to um, see better at night or they are able to um, have enhanced other senses, right? So maybe echolocation in bats um, has evolved as a character displacement due to competition with other um, insectivorous animals during the day. Um, and so I want to show you a brief clip um, of, um, again, some anoles. Um, and so this experiment is um, essentially um, looking at limb length on these guys, um, and they're not looking at it in terms of competition, but I want you to think about um, the fact that competition can drive evolution in the same way. Jonathan and his colleagues wanted to see if they could observe the lizard's traits evolve by conducting another kind of experiment. Their inspiration was the rapidly changing environment of some of the smallest Caribbean islands. Hurricanes occasionally swamp these tiny islands, scrubbing them free of lizards. The team realized they could use the depleted islands as laboratories. They began their experiment by capturing tree-dwelling anoles on a larger island. Oh, well, there's one out there. Yeah. Good. Then they visited seven islands that a hurricane had cleared of lizards. On each, they placed a female and male anole. Too much vegetation in yeah, it's just yeah. these islands have no trees, only small bushes. In the sun or in the shade? Uh, he's actually... How would the long legged lizards fare on thin branches? The next year, the scientists returned. She will be back. She will be they found back. that the mating pairs they had introduced not only survived, but reproduced. and the new population had grown and taken to living on thin branches. And now she's in my noose. Good. The scientists collected the lizards. So the height off the Every time we found a lizard, we measured how high it was off the ground, 40 centimeters. the diameter of the surface, okay. and whether it was perched head up, head down, or horizontal. They brought them back to their field lab, took x-rays to precisely measure the length of their legs, and scanned their toe pads. Then they returned each lizard to the exact spot where they had found it. Okay, all right. Well. Now they had baseline data on the new populations. A year later, they came back. All right, I think he gave us a slip. Okay. Uh. Excellent. and discovered that the average lizard leg had shortened 
in just two generations. Well, we thought maybe this is just a fluke, a statistical accident. In fact, over four years, the populations all got shorter and shorter and shorter legs. Evolution can occur very rapidly when natural selection is strong. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you from um, this experiment. Um, again, this is um, <laughs> this is an experimental situation. There's nothing to do with competition here, but um, if if different species of a knoll were competing in a particular niche, some might move up branches or might move to um, bushes that have smaller branches, and of course, over time. In fact, only just a few generations, we can see an actual morphological shift in the average population. So not in individuals, it's not individual legs getting longer and therefore becoming more adapted to this new environment. Um, instead, um, it is over multiple generations, the longer led and longer legged anoles are going to be more successful. They are going to eat more, they are going to reproduce more, and therefore the next generation is going to have longer legs. Okay, so competition can be this strong selective pressure that the scientist was just talking about. Okay, um, and so I think at this point we can appreciate that uh, it's never just one species interacting with one other species. In reality, there's a lot of different competitive interactions happening simultaneously. Um, so if we uh, were to kind of zoom out, what we would see is that there are um, multiple populations, multiple species that are more prevalent in some, under some environmental conditions, as opposed to other environmental conditions. And so here in this graph, we can see um, the fundamental niches of four different species. Here is an environmental gradient. Um, and if we were to take a sample, right, at any one of these um, points along the environmental gradient, we would see that there's um, kind of a different um, abundance of these different species okay, because they you know are uh, competing and of course because they are um, adapted to different zones of tolerance. Um, again, in reality, um, these um, multiple interactions between all these different species um, are essentially limiting the fundamental niche um, or the, the realized niche of these organisms. So there's um, much less overlap here because of the selection pressure of competition. Okay, so once again, if we were to uh, take a sample at this particular point, we would see what is called the relative abundance of these different species, okay, all driving each other to live in different places in different ways, and of course, to evolve in the process. Okay. Um, In this Lotka Volterra model that we've seen again and again and again, um, I want to point out that um, the competition coefficients, um, of course, are really important in um, deciding the outcome of the competition. Right? We looked at that with the two different squirrels and with um, the bald eagle and the osprey. Um, and so once again, I want to point out that the competition coefficients um, ultimately um, are very important in determining the size of the population next year or the change in the population between this year and next year. Um, and of course, this is uh, dependent also on the number of the competitive species, right? How many um, individuals are going to be exerting this per capita influence on species number two, for example. Um, also, the other thing is uh, carrying capacities, right? So different carrying capacities very much affect competition. Um, now, along um, a, an environmental gradient or even when there are alterations in environmental conditions, this can change both the competition coefficient, right? how well an individual um, is able to compete, um, and of course, this ties back to the zone of tolerance, right? If uh, the environment um, starts to become, you know, kind of closer to those tails or right, the areas of stress in the zone of tolerance, um, then um, they are not going to be able to compete as well, right? So these competition coefficients aren't 
fixed, right? They change according to environmental conditions. Um, furthermore, the carrying capacity, um, as we have seen, can also change according to environmental conditions. Okay? So if it gets super hot all of a sudden, um, maybe the food source for a particular animal um, is going to dry up and therefore it isn't offering the same nutritional capacity as it was before. And so the carrying capacity of that herbivore is going to decline in response indirectly to the shift in environmental condition. Um, so in your textbook, there's a couple uh, different examples of this. Um, so here um, we can see three different uh, species of fish. Um, the scientists ultimately um, warmed up the water that they were living in and they monitored uh, competition. Um, so what they saw was that the two species of trout were really uh, really strong competitors when the water temperature was really cold. Okay? But as the water warmed up, what they saw was that the trout, right, maybe have reached the stress end of the zone of tolerance. And so they are just trying to exist and aren't really able to compete as strongly. And so we can see um, that they are able to eat less right, when they are not able to compete as strongly. Um, at the same time, we can see that the chub uh, was able to compete much better when the water was warmer. Okay, so we can see that in these uh, areas of transition that this species here is going to become more successful and these species become less successful. Okay, um, we can also see um, this shift in, um, in competition over time and in field. Uh, so this graph here, also from your textbook, is showing uh, two different species of grasses in Zimbabwe over a 10-year period. Um, in the first two years of this particular study, um, this grass was doing really well. Right? So it's really uh, well adapted to drought conditions. Um, but as the rains returned, this species, Right, can do a lot better in wet conditions than it can in dry conditions. And so it was therefore able to outcompete the dry adapted species. Okay, so once again, um, the competition coefficient and the carrying capacities are not fixed numbers. They are very much um, tied to abiotic factors. These abiotic factors, of course, can change over time. So think about climate change, um, but also they can change, of course, over a natural gradient. Okay, so um, here, uh, what we can see is uh, resource availability. Right? So maybe over here, resources are super abundant. Okay? Over here, resources are limited. Right? We can think about um, different environments where you know, there would be a lot of resources and fewer resources or, you know, a temperature gradient, et cetera. Um, and so because of these, um, you know, essential fundamental, essentially fundamental niches um, overlapping, we see very high competition here where the resources are super high and much lower competition over here you know, essentially opening up some available space, available resources for only those species that are acclimated or that are adapted to low resource environments. And so, you know, just like we've been seeing before, um, we see this nice um, niche partitioning with the, maybe the, the high growth rate, super hungry plants occupying this part of the physical space, um, the uh, species E, right, is really low, slow growing, but is okay with very few resources. And so it can fill um, this part of the niche over here. And we can see that at different parts along this gradient, there is this nice separation of um, species um, locations. Um, and so we saw this when Eric came to our class uh, and talked about Arizona. Um, here we can see um, the different zones 
that are produced along this environmental gradient. Um, in this case, it is an altitude gradient, which also comes with um, temperature gradients and moisture gradients as well, just like we talked about in the very beginning of class. Um, and so um, the reason why these particular species end up where they do is because of this competition um, driving um, the niches apart, right? Driving this uh, niche partitioning and ultimately, um, you know, creating these more or less uh, definitive zones. Um, we can also see this um, along um, a shoreline gradient. Um, we've, we've seen uh, this example before, but essentially here's the water, here are upland plants. And so, um, you know, as we move in this direction, there's more and more physical stress, right? So there's less oxygen in the soil. Um, there might be more salt in the soil, more salt in the water. And so um, the plants that are able to withstand those particular conditions won't have the same level of competition in those really stressful conditions just because not everybody has those same adaptations. Not everybody can live in such harsh um, such a harsh environment. Okay. Um, on the other hand, up here, there's less water, right? And so these plants would be more adapted to less, um, less moisture and right? more droughty conditions. Okay. So uh, once again, we see this very distinct zonation. Um, one of the things that a lot of um, ecological surveyors do is um, wetland delineation. So essentially they um, look at the soil, they look at the vegetation type and essentially say here is where the wetland stops. Right? That's important because uh, you're only allowed to build um, in upland environments. If you do build in a wetland environment, you're required to build another wetland of the same area. Um, of course, they're never as good um, as the original, the ones that were naturally made, um, but really important if you are a developer. Uh, and so at this point, we've talked a lot about what is going on with individual populations. We've talked about how populations can interact with one another. If we zoom out yet again, kind of move up that ecological hierarchy one more rung, we can see that all of these different species are competing. All of them are um, you know, interacting in different ways. They're coexisting as a community. Now, community structure can be measured, it can be analyzed, just like all of the other levels of the ecological hierarchy that we've talked about so far. Um, we can um, understand a community as just the sum of all of the interactions among all of the species. Um, We're going to see some of that modeling, both in this lesson, as well as um, the video that you guys are going to watch after this. Um, we can look at the total number of species and how abundant each one of those are, right? So it's one individual of a species still counts as a species, but it's not very abundant. It's not having such a profound impact on the rest of the species in that community. Okay. Um, finally, we can look at the physical attributes of the community. Uh, this is something that we talked about a long time ago in this class. Uh, so we looked at um, the uh, you know, how much the light penetrated through the water or through um, the canopy of a forest, right? We could see these different levels of the photic zone versus the aphotic zone, right? The epilimnion versus the hypolimnion, okay? So there's this physical structure based on water, based on vegetation type, okay? So we can look at all of those things um, which are actually produced um, or at least influenced by the community structure, okay? Um, and as always, we can definitely quantify um, these attributes so that we can compare, and, uh, compare these attributes between communities or um, over, um, over time. Uh, one of the first things that we can do is we can just count up the number of species. <laughs> or count up the number of individuals within a species that is. Um, so what we can see here are two different forests in West Virginia. 
Um, here is the list of species that were found in one or both of these uh, of these stands. Um, in stand number one, we can see that the species are ranked according to the most abundant, right? so 76 yellow poplars as opposed to one of each of these here. Um, note that in stand number one, these are all ranked according to abundance, right? so the uh, number of individuals of a species. Um, and so, uh, you know, where there are multiple species, or that have the same number of individuals, you know, it's essentially just a tie here. It um, doesn't matter if sugar maple or red maple is first, they both have the same number of individuals. Um, in stand number two, um, we can also see that the species are ranked, okay? uh, but not in order just because both are on the same chart here. Um, again, the most abundant is yellow poplar. Um, we can see that a lot of the species that are found in stand one are not found in stand two. And finally, butternut is found in stand two, but not stand one. Okay, so we can look at this and we can get a pretty good idea about um, the mixture of uh, plants within this community. Um, we can calculate the relative abundance by adding up all of this, uh, the individuals within the entire stand and then dividing the number of yellow poplars over the total to give us the percentage or the relative abundance. Now we can take this type of data um, and we can uh, visualize it maybe a little bit more clearly by plotting it on a rank abundance diagram or a rank abundance graph. Um, once again, these are the ranks. So this is number one, the most abundant plant. This is the 24th most abundant plant species within this community. And here, again, the relative abundance. Okay. Um, just by looking at this, we can see that stand one here in brown has a lot more different species. Okay. So it's a lot more diverse than stand two is. Okay. Um, on top of simple abundance, right, number of species, um, or the, the number of organisms of a species <laughs> within the community, uh, we can also look at species richness. Okay? So species richness is purely the number of species within that community. Okay? So abundance is how many individuals in the species. The species richness is 10 species for plot two and 24 species for plot number one. We can also look at species diversity. And so this is essentially the species richness here, the number of species, but weighted according to the relative abundance. Okay, so the number of individuals within that. So it's kind of combining the abundance as well as uh, the richness together. Okay, um, what we can see here are three different communities. Okay, um, species A is very abundant in community one, right? The rest of them much less abundant. Community two has six species, right? So species richness is six, just like community one. And essentially, um, this community is relatively evenly distributed, right? So there are three individuals of each of these different species. Uh, and finally, community three, also has a really even distribution of individuals among these species, but it has only five species, not six species. And so we're not gonna do this math in class, but here is um, the Shannon index. And that essentially is going to account for both the number of species and the relative abundance. Okay, um, and so, if we look down here, we can see that the highest values are calculated for a community that has the most species, so six versus five, and the most evenness of the uh, relative abundance. Okay, so um, evenness and number of species 
gets the highest Shannon index value. Okay, this one has a lot of species, but it's not even. This one is pretty even, but it doesn't have a lot of species. Um, another way of measuring species diversity, um, this is called the Simpsons diversity index. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can measure diversity. I'm just giving you two. Um, once again, what we can see is uh, two different communities. Uh, each one has four raptors. Okay, so two hawks, a kite, and an owl. Okay, so four species in this and this community. So species, species richness S is four for both. Uh, the Simpsons diversity index, which is abbreviated as D, um, also weights the relative abundance. So here we can see that the first community is relatively evenly distributed, but the second community has mostly red-tailed hawks and very few of the others. And so uh, region A, which is pretty um, even, right, has a, uh, a higher diversity index because of the even distribution. Now, these communities, right, regardless of how diverse they are, regardless of how um, ab abundant the species are, um, they can be um, visualized in two opposing ways. Okay, so uh, for this first view of communities, um, the observation that ecologists are making was that um, communities in similar environments are often pretty similar because of similar environmental conditions. So for example, on a hilltop, um, this hilltop versus this hilltop, the communities are probably going to be the same. Both are going to be more similar to each other than the valley, which is technically closer to either of the hilltops. Okay, so um, environment is what is, you know, essentially um, determining what community composition you're going to see. Um, so essentially, um, you know, scientist Frederick Clements um, stated that communities essentially act like organisms themselves. Um, so each species is actually acting like an organ or an organ system. All of them are working together to form this entire organism based on whatever the environmental conditions are. And of course, these communities can change um, over time, which is succession, which is what we're going to be talking about in our next class together, um, or they can change, um, you know, to follow the environmental conditions that they need. Okay, so Clement says communities essentially act like organisms. Um, to visualize that a little bit more, um, here is this example. Um, this uh, more upland um, community here. Um, this is very predictable, you know, given these conditions, right, just over the high tide mark, you are always going to find this grouping of species. Um, next, in the tidal zone, you're always going to find this group of species. So that is a community, it is predictable. All of these organisms interact with each other, they depend on each other, they're competing with, one in, with each other. But this zone, zone two here, is a distinct organismic community. Um, and similarly, uh, below low tide, so always submerged in the water, has another very distinctive community. Okay, so if you were to look at the distribution, uh, what we would see is, you know, underwater all the time, the tidal zone, and above the high tide mark, these species are grouped together into their distinctive communities. Of course, there is a transition zone, which is stressful you know, for these guys, it's stressful for these guys, but technically um, uh, their range is going to overlap here. Okay. On the other hand, there is a second view of communities, um, and that looks a little bit more like this. As opposed to these distinct groups and some kind of brief transition zone, this concept um, states that 
communities essentially are more like a continuum. You don't see one community stop and another one start. Instead, it's individual organisms that are responding directly to the environmental conditions, not to the other organisms, okay, but directly to the environmental gradient, therefore producing um, a more uh, continuous gradient of community structure. Okay, and so this is called the individualistic, right? so individual species are responding to the environment, um, or the continuum concept of communities. Um, and so the, the fact that all of these organisms are living in the same place at the same time as a community is really just because they happen to have evolved to have the same requirements, the same types of zones, or the same zone of tolerance, right, or at least overlapping, um, not because all of the animals are or and uh, plants, etc., are evolving together. Um, so this one was um, popularized by Gleason. Um, and uh, if you wanted to test these two contrasting views, um, there is, of course, some math that you can do that with. Um, there is no one answer. Okay? Um, it's a little bit of both, and you can actually um, test you know, which one uh, is being experienced. Okay. Regardless um, of whether uh, the community is more organismic or it's more individualistic, um, there are a lot of different interactions uh, going on within communities. Um, so it is a challenge to represent all of those different interactions. And so um, one of the more simplistic ways that has been um, used for quite some time um, is a food chain. Okay? So essentially uh, the grass feeds the grasshopper, the grasshopper transfers energy to the sparrow, the sparrow transfers energy to the hawk. And okay? so essentially um, this super simplistic um, expression of a community um, is showing us the different trophic levels. Right? So the primary producers and okay, the primary consumers, the secondary consumers, and ultimately this um, apex predator. Okay? So these are trophic levels, right, are going up the food chain. Um, of course, this is overly simplistic. A much more realistic expression would be to combine multiple food webs into or <laughs> food chains into a food web. So this is much more realistic, albeit much more um, overwhelming to look at. Right. So it's never the grass is never just eaten by the grasshopper. Right? It's always a lot more complex. A lot of things are going to eat the grass. Um, the grass itself, um, we can call it an autotroph because it's a photosynthesizer. We can call it a primary producer for the same reason. Um, a lot of times if we are referring specifically to a food web, um, we can call it a basal species as well. Okay. Um, ultimately, um, heterotrophs, right, so the animal or the organisms that are doing the eating, not the ones that are the primary producers, these guys eat each other, right? Note that um, the apex or top predator um, you know, is ultimately receiving all of this energy flow from all of these organisms farther down the food web or in lower trophic levels. Um, note that the arrows are always going in the direction of energy flow, right? So this guy is eating this guy, okay? and this is called a link. Um, when, so the most links that could possibly be formed in a food web, that is, they can possibly be formed within a community. Um, it is a direct function of species richness. So the more species are present within a community, the more links there are. And so a community like this all of a sudden seems really simple when you think about all the other organisms that are present within this community. Okay. Um, assuming that every single species may link in some way oops, uh, to every other species, the maximum number of links is S squared. 
Okay, so we can calculate, and this isn't something that we're going to do, but we can calculate something called food web connectance, okay, which is essentially, um, you know, the total number of possible links over the number of links that are actually being experienced in that community. And we can see, you know, essentially, um, we, we can learn a little bit more about the community structure just by seeing um, how many species are affecting each other. Okay. Of course, as the species richness increases, the food web becomes just wildly complicated. Um, it is much too complex to just present out on a flat piece of paper and actually be able to see where all the links are. Um, and so it turns out that uh, we can simplify our expression of food webs um, by grouping species into compartments. Okay, so to compartmentalize the food webs, which is something that happens naturally, and we can just think about groups of species instead of every single individual species. And okay, so generally what we see, um, instead of just interspersed um, interactions between all of these species more or less um, ubiquitously, instead species generally group together and there's lots of interactions between them, but generally there's minimal um, minimal interactions between these different compartments. And so we can connect this back to that zonation concept. Um, so the, uh, the animals that are living underwater all the time are not really interacting that much with the tidal zone animals, right? And they're certainly not interacting much, if at all, with the animals that are in, that are above the high tide mark. Okay. Uh, so generally we can compartmentalize generally along zone boundaries or um, you know different uh, sub niches okay, um, within the larger community. And so just one example of this um, is uh, a study of a Caribbean ecosystem. Turns out there were over 3,000 trophic interactions. And if you were to map them all out, it looks something like this, which is super difficult to actually learn anything from. But we can also see that um, these, that there are colors, right? Five different colors. Um, and we can see that for the most part, those dots are grouped together. And so if we simplify the model a little bit, and instead of talking about this species versus this species, now we can say this group of species can affect this group of species as well. And so we can simplify this big mess here down to that. Okay. Another way to simplify the study of community organization, you know, just so that we can um, learn a little bit more about it and then kind of uh, scale up a little bit, um, we can use something called guilds. And okay. so another way of uh, kind of subdividing the community structure just for our understanding um, is to use guilds, um, essentially grouping similarly functioning species within a community. Um, so oftentimes these guys share a particular resource. So um, nectar um, is used by both hummingbirds and other nectar feeding birds, maybe butterflies. So all of these organisms are using the same resource, and so they might they might have the same um, uh, the same links as each other. And also, um, anything that eats seeds, right? so small mammals like a vole or something, um, as well as seeding birds, they are going to have a lot of the same links. And so we can think about them together if we're trying to get a, a pretty good picture of the entire community. Okay. Um, again, this creates a potential for really strong interactions between guilds. Um, and even within the guilds, um, a lot of interspecific competition. Okay. So we can zoom in on one guild as opposed to trying to grapple with the entire community. Okay. Furthermore, um, this isn't just easier to study the community by breaking it into guilds um, or breaking it into compartments, but it's also a lot easier to protect. Um, to protect um, 
resources for all of the hummingbirds and anything else that's going to feed on nectar. Okay, so instead of just focusing on one species, you could study on this whole group of species um, and manage for the guild instead. Okay. Um, uh, so, so far we have seen that communities have lots of different interactions. Okay. We can express these interactions via a food web. It can get really complicated, really clunky, really quickly. And so we can break down the food web into guilds and compartments. Also, we can study particular species that have more of an impact on everybody else or most of everybody else than other species. All right, so the idea here is that not every species is created equally. Some have a huge impact, lots and lots of links. Others do not. Okay, so the term for this type of species is a keystone species, which uh, we've talked about a little bit in class before, and you've probably heard before, but keystone species has a huge impact on the community, especially if you remove it. Okay, so there are so many links to the keystone species that if you were to remove it, essentially the community can collapse. Okay, so um, an example of this, which uh, you're going to see in uh, today's video, um, is the cottonwood in Western ecosystems. Um, Eric talked about this a little bit when he talked to our class. I've mentioned a little bit as well. Um, essentially, this species um, grows along uh, or grows within riparian ecosystems um, and you know surrounded by grasslands surrounded by deserts um, here we can see just a rough rocky desert um, you know prickly pear cactus right here but then this lush community down here um, including community structure including um, habitat and food for tons of different species Okay, so it is a keystone species when it has been removed. Um, so, you know, in the 1800s, when steam uh, boats were going down the Colorado River, um, if they ran out of fuel to make fire, to make steam, to make the boat go, they would just cut down trees along the river, burn them, and then they could go on their merry way. Um, and so that removal of the species made the entire ecosystem around the Colorado River collapse. And they a lot of effort to regrow those communities now. Okay. Um, another keystone species is uh, corals, right, or keystone uh, kind of interactions, um, communities. Um, so coral reefs, of course, support tons of different species if the corals die off, then the entire community can collapse. Okay. Uh, and so keystone species is kind of a big umbrella term for really important species that influences a lot of others. But foundation species is what I've just been talking about. Um, so it's a subtype of keystone species. It is essentially an ecosystem engineer because it not only is really important for a lot of things, but specifically it's important for forming the habitat itself. Okay, so uh, birds and spiders and aphids and all sorts of things are going to be living in cottonwoods. Okay, tons of different types of fish and invertebrates are going to be living in corals. Okay, and so these foundation species are um, controlling the entire ecosystem from the bottom up. Right, so we're seeing that once again, bottom up control by these foundation species. Um, these both are primary producers, but other types of um, ecosystem engineers are things like beavers. Um, we have also seen a lot of top down um, influence as well. I want to point out that these, that predators can also be keystone species, right? So it's not just a foundation species working from the bottom up, it's also predators working as keystone species from the top down. Um, we talked a little bit about the wolves and coyotes, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, example here, um, with an apex predator in this marine environment, 
the apex predator is ultimately able to eat the herbivores, right? So eat lots of crabs. Um, if the herbivore population is kept down, the uh, grass population, right, the vegetation is able to increase. Okay? That is going to provide a lot of different what are called ecosystem services uh, for the marine environment as well as for those living adjacent to the marine environment. Um, so for example, lots of carbon sequestration, right? so bringing carbon dioxide out of the air, out of the water, um, storing it in carbon molecules within the plant and ultimately within the soil. And therefore, no uh, reduced CO2 out here in the air and, of course, making the ocean more acidic that we learned a long time ago. And now that carbon is stored within the soil. Okay. Also, more vegetation because the vegetation is being eaten less because its herbivores are being eaten more is going to decrease erosion. Okay, so the coast is going to be protected. We're not going to have these huge washouts. You're not going to have as large of waves. Um, so a lot of different ecosystem services can be provided just by having this apex predator. Um, if the predator is removed, essentially that pressure on the crabs is reduced. Crabs are therefore able to eat a lot more of that vegetation. So vegetation is going to be reduced as well all of those lovely ecosystem services that it was providing, right, bringing carbon out of the air um, and storing it, therefore reducing greenhouse gases, reducing ocean, ocean acidification, right, all of those things aren't done without the carbon sequestration done by those plants. Okay. Furthermore, those plants are providing erosion control. That is not the case if the crabs are going to, or are able to eat them and so bigger waves right, more flooding, coastal erosion, and this guy is uh, not in good shape. Um, and so I want to point out that um, humans can act in the same way. <laughs> um, we, of course, uh, build our houses right next to the beach. We build our colleges right next to the beach, um, and we, um, you know, don't leave much space for all of these ecosystem services that are naturally provided by having this nice stable ecosystem, right? Yes, we have a little bit of a dune that we have some patchy grass on, but really it's nothing in comparison to the way that um, it's supposed to be, right? The barrier islands are barriers for the mainland, not necessarily for, um, you know, putting up beach houses, right? That being said, you know, well, never mind. <laughs> go, go there. Okay, that is the end of this video for now. Um, make sure that you watch the next video in which I will give an explanation uh, for what comes next. Thanks.